A warm welcome, everybody, to our departmental um, seminar this week. Um, we have Sam Himmelweit presenting today. Sam is an LSE fellow um, here in our department. Before joining us as a fellow, he was a um, PhD student here um, too and worked as a, as a research um, officer long, long, long time ago. He even did our um, MSc in European social policy um, back in the day. And I um, actually still fond memories of that cohort when we went to um, Cumberland Lodge and played table tennis for a rather long time in that um, basement there. So it was a um, rather special cohort, um, I, I thought, and um, was quite excited when he wanted to return to, to us for his PhD. Out of this PhD, he um, is presenting one paper um, that specifically his PhD was on work family reforms in Germany and the UK from an ideational point of view. So Sam's an ideas person. And here is a, not anymore, maybe, <laughs> um, um, leaving, leaving the dark side. Um, um, so a paper that looks specifically um, at fathers in, in work family reform. Um, fathers who do not normally receive as much attention as mothers. Um, um, and here the German, com German British comparison is quite intriguing because Germany as a rather conservative country where you would have thought getting fathers involved is a bit more difficult actually made um, surprising um, um, improvements whereas the UK continues to lag behind um, um, somewhat. And um, that puzzle, um, Sam will, um, explain to us, I guess, then. Um, the floor is, is yours. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for coming, everyone. Um, yeah, so as Timo said, this, this presentation is um, a paper that's a sort of spin off <laughs> of my PhD. It's currently, I'm about to resubmit it after um, comments at our journal, so fingers crossed that it goes through. But um, yeah, it's entitled Leaving Fathers Behind The Politics of Departing the Male Breadwinner Model in Germany and the UK. But this is the outline of the presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly a bit about background and why it's interesting to talk about Father's Lead, um, and then look at the research aims and case selection of this particular project, um, with a, a little discussion of theoretical approach and methods, and then I'll get into the kind of analysis, which is, um, first I'll look at Germany and then the UK, and then I'll bring it together in a sort of comparative analysis, as Timo said, focusing on ideas, but politics of ideas. So whether I'm strictly an ideas person is up for debate. Um, so the main background of this is this quite dramatic expansion of work family reconciliation problem, um, policies that we've seen over the OECD since the 90s, really. So this follows um, what Scandinavian countries did in the sort of 70s and 80s of mainly expanding early education and childcare, but also um, spending, um, sort of reconfiguring maternity leave and parental leave policies. Um, and this table just gives you a brief summary of what, what we see over that time in just very headline terms. And you can see that basically um, spending on ECEC is early childhood education and care, so childcare, um, has grown quite dramatically over that time, as has the coverage among children under three. But also we see an extension of paid leave for women and men over that time, but obviously much more for women than men. Um, and then replacement rates have also grown, although for parental leave, but not so much, well, not at all really for maternity leave if we're looking across the OECD. And if you remove Scandinavian countries, you see perhaps more of a dramatic shift. But one thing this comparison shows you is that Scandinavian countries are still uh, modernizing their policies as well. So it's not that they have done it and everyone else is now catching up. But, um, but, um, but yeah, but roughly the literature, the sort of theoretical literature addresses this as um, a process of departing the male breadwinner model family, right? Adjusting family policy to take account of um, socioeconomic trends, such as changing patterns of family formation, large growth in female employment, um, and changing skill needs in post-industrial economies. And so, um, and this can be seen as reflected in um, the sort of various policy rationales across that have been used across the OECD for expanding work family policies, including, I mean, the primary one really has been increasing female employment, but also adapting to increased female employment. Um, but other ones include improving child development, combating poverty, increasing birth rates, and then to a certain extent, improving gender equality, although there's quite a lot of um, 
the literature has pointed out that that was much more of an explicit aim for Scandinavian countries than it has been for these sort of latecomer reformers. Um, and among these latecomer reformers, path departure away from the male breadwinner model is clearly most stark in countries where policy was explicitly or implicitly designed around male breadwinner model families. And Germany and the UK are two examples of that. Um, so why do we care about leave for fathers? Well, um, you know, a key point about moving beyond the male breadwinner model family involves men need to change their behaviour as well as women, right? There's been a lot of, um, a lot of the feminist literature has highlighted that women have increased their employment over the past decades, but men have not increased time spent in unpaid care by anywhere near the same extent. Um, and a number of um, analysts have pointed out that um, policies that promote women's employment, you know, without taking into account the division of unpaid labour within their household, end up placing further burdens on women, because women are expected to work, but at the same time, um, <laughs> undertake the, the majority of unpaid care. Um, also, in terms of women's labour market position, the birth of children is one of the main triggers of divergent labour market outcomes between women and men. And um, part of this is that time out of the labour market at childcare has long-term effects on employment and earnings of women. And there are quite a lot of empirical studies that also focus on how um, fathers' leave is associated with various, um, I guess, positive outcomes, such as higher female employment, more equal division of childcare and unpaid household work, and, and a more equal division that lasts a significant, uh, that has a duration of time, basically. And you can see that also in continued um, fathers that take leave, tend to stay more involved with children after divorce, things like that. Um, and also paternal involvement in childcare or in children, in their children's lives is associated with numerous child development benefits and higher life satisfaction for both parents. So there's all sorts of reasons why we should be interested in fathers. Um, and also from an analytic point of view, fathers have been a key, point, key part of the Scandinavian model that later path departures um, have to a certain extent followed. So you can see from these three bullet points that the Scandinavian countries introduced various kinds of leave policies that were aimed at um, first enabling fathers to take leave um, and later on trying to incentivize leave. So this is um, reserved parental leave. And there's quite a large body of research that suggests that if you want to incentivize fathers to take leave, then leave policy needs to be designed in specific ways, right? So it has to be relatively well paid, it has to last a reasonable amount of time. So we're not just talking um, sort of paternity leave after childbirth, which is really um, usually a small number of weeks for, for men to be present after childbirth, but we're talking about months rather than weeks. And it needs to be a reserved individual right. So fathers, so on a kind of use it or lose it basis, so that um, basically that it can't be automatically given to mothers. Um, and one way that some countries do it is to, um, also think about bonus periods. So if a certain amount of leave is used by the father, then the family as a whole gets more leave to share between a couple. Um, so what we see over the OECD is actually quite dramatic variation. This has not come out very well. Quite dramatic variation in the uh, number of weeks of paid leave that are reserved for fathers. So this is just showing basically that um, this is all, um, all weeks in total that are reserved for fathers. So lots of countries, it's very few. So these are basically the countries that um, primarily do paternity leave. And then quite a few countries now are, are offering a lot more. And the green bars are the ones that are what's considered well paid. So this is ones that um, pay at more than 65% of earnings, which the literature seems to suggest is what counts as well paid. Um, this is not the total that's available to men in each country. This is the total that's reserved for men. So um, bearing in mind the previous point about design that might um, encourage men to take it. What and so, the top? sorry? What are the two at the top? That's Korea and Japan. Um, but you can see the Scandinavian countries are here, these three. And then Germany is here, a green bar. So there, there's two months for men there. And the UK is down here, which is two weeks and not particularly well paid. I think it works out about 19% of um, average earnings is paid in the UK, whereas in Germany it's 67 or 65. Um, so, my project is exploring the reasons for 
Well, so my broader interest is exploring the reasons for variation in work family policy reform over um, among latecomer countries. And in particular, this project looks at the extent to which fathers have been included in work family policy reforms. And so I do a case study of two latecomer countries, Germany and the UK, both of which were strong male breadwinner model countries, um, and both which undertook this broad process of reform, um, including large expansions in childcare and major reconfigurations of leave policy. Um, there's also some other similarities, perhaps I'll go into later, I'm gonna go quicker here. Um, but basically, one analytical similarity is the comparative literature highlights the importance of electoral competition as a spur for these kind of reforms in both the UK and Germany. Um, however, and this is where the cases are interesting, as Timo mentioned before, German reforms basically involved a reconfiguration of leave policy where um, a family now gets 12 months um, paid at 67% of salary that they can split however they want, but they get an extra two months if the father takes at least two months. So that's a sort of reserved and bonus period for fathers. Whereas the UK's reforms um, overwhelmingly focus on mothers. So basically after all of the reform process, fathers receive two weeks paternity leave paid at this low flat rate, as I said, which is around, I think 19% of um, the equivalent of average earnings. And then the option for mothers to transfer part of her leave to fathers, um, which is also paid at the same low flat rate. So in terms of what we saw in the slide before, this, the Germany has reserved bonus well-paid leave and the UK doesn't, UK's configuration doesn't really meet either of those, or any of those criteria. And so this provides an empirical puzzle. So why did part of parting work family policy reform lead to divergent outcomes in leave policy? Or as people in the literature often frame it, why did Germany make a Nordic turn um, while the UK remained on its maternalist trajectory um, in leave policy in particular? So I think I'm going to go fast through this and we can talk, um, if anyone's interested, we can talk about it later, but the dominant theories in the literature struggle really to account for this dif difference. So one is power resources theory, which basically posits that left-wing governments will expand the welfare state, right-wing governments will shrink the welfare state, and that's been adapted to family policy, um, roughly saying that left-wing governments will do more for gender equality than right-wing governments. Um, so you might think, so given that um, both of the reform periods that we're interested in here started when a centre-left government came into power after a long period of centre-right rule in both countries, you'd assume, so that's Labour in the UK in 97 and the SPD in Germany in 1998, you'd assume that both are good candidates for this kind of reform. But from a comparative perspective, um, the opportunities perhaps were more promising in the UK, where Labour remained in power for 13 years, while the SPD was out of power, or not out of power, but became the junior member in a coalition after seven years. Um, there's also all sorts of sort of political institutional reasons why a uh, left-wing government in the UK may have more power to implement its policies than, um, than a German one. But most puzzling from this perspective is actually under the conservative-led, CDU-led coalition um, from 2006 that the most dramatic German reforms took place. So that's a real challenge to this literature. And one answer to that challenge has been this theory of electoral competition. Um, in which basically posits that changing electoral clearances and um, especially among women, um, women's changing voting behavior um, has spurred parties to compete for women's votes. And that has been found, as I said before, to be a key driver of reform um, of politicians becoming interested in um, work family policies, even among traditional left-wing parties who weren't traditionally interested in these kind of policies, right? Which is true of both Labour and the SPD. So, um, and this theory has been taken on and sort of expanded a bit to look at which countries where electoral competition has evolved and where it hasn't. And one of the key variables seems to be the extent to which social attitudes have shifted away from those underpinning the male breadwinner model, um, which presents a problem for the case of the UK and Germany, because as Timo mentioned before, Germany is socially more of a conservative country when it comes to thinking about gender roles and families. And you can see that's true of, of the, the whole population. It's true of women who are often seen as the target of this electoral competition, or even with younger women. It's still true of younger women, um, who, which some sections of the electoral competition um, argument focus on. 
And it's also true both at the beginning and at the end of the period of interest here. So the period of greatest reform, there isn't a significantly larger shift in Germany. And if anything, Britain remains more progressive in its um, social attitudes towards um, gender roles and who cares for children. So my approach is to um, is slightly different to most of the comparative literature on work family policy, because most of the literature aims to um, is uh, aims to explain whether change occurred or not. So explain the points of change. So electoral competition is used to explain why change happened in certain countries and not in others. But I'm more interested not to explain whether change occurred, but to explore variation in that change. So, so given that change did occur in both the UK and Germany, but um, it's um, and the electoral competition argument helps explain why new ideas come onto um, the scene in both countries, but it can't really tell us about why there are these divergent trajectories. So why did um, work family policy reform include fathers in Germany and not so much in the UK? Um, electoral competition alone can't really explain that. And a key argument of the ideational literature is that without an understanding of the content of new ideas, you can't understand specific policy reforms, so specific policy choices. Um, and I've got a quote there, which is a slightly fancier way of saying that, which is structural explanations of institutional change are indeterminate regarding subsequent institutional form. Um, and this, and an argument here would be that this is particularly true of families, of policies related to families, which are often held related to pretty deep held, you know, social norms, perhaps related to religious views. Um, and there's a nice quote from Jane Lewis here, the whole issue of how to balance paid work and the unpaid work of care carried out by men and women in families is to some extent a euphemism for competing ideas about childbearing and thus the role of parents, especially the mothers of young children, held by politicians, professionals and parents themselves. So the ideational literature focuses on how, um, or, well, it's very broad and it focuses on lots of different things, but one of the things it focuses on is how the framing of new policy problems has been shown to shape future uh, reforms, in part because problems um, define what solutions are later considered acceptable and not. Um, and so one of the things I'm interested in is examining the way that um, ideas are framed in the two cases. But I'm not just interested in comparing the ideas behind the form, the reform, but analyzing their impact on processes of change. So within their institutional and political context. So this is why I'm talking about the politics of ideas, not just um, an ideational comparison. And the ideational literature highlights a number of mechanisms by which ideas themselves can lead to policy change. And one of those is um, as a coalition magnet. So where an idea is perhaps broadly stated enough that it can draw together um, a diverse coalition of supporters that previously would not have been able to agree on certain policy aims um, and in new ways. So the, the appearance of the idea forms this coalition. Um, a second one is how uh, ideas can act as roadmaps which help individual politicians, or not just individual, but actors, chart a path towards a strategic goal. And I'll talk more about that a bit later. Um, and yeah, and then this, but this is necessarily rooted in an institutional and political context. So the agenda setting literature is really important here in terms of um, understanding how new ideas emerge during what's known as windows of opportunity and how their success, at least in part, relates to the institutional position or the power of the actors that are promoting those ideas. Um, and ob obviously, there is also numerous other factors which go into explaining policy, including policy legacies and other institutional factors. Right, um, I'm going to not talk about this in any great detail at all, but basically, my focus is on this period of reform. So a comparative an an analysis of ideas in their respective political and institutional context. This is the period I'm interested in. So the period when um, a centre-left government came into power and roughly the end of this period is the onset of the financial crisis, which more or less put an end to momentum for reform in the two countries, at least <coughs> temporarily. Um, the primary research that I undertook for this is um, a documentary analysis um, of parliamentary debates, government documents, policy documents, consultation responses, um, also contemporary media reports, press interviews, and then books and memoirs written by key figures. Um, but I supplemented this with interviews in both countries, so 22 in the UK and 20 in Germany, and this was of um, basically people involved in the process of reform. So politicians, civil servants, political advisors, 
and interest group representatives. And that includes business representatives, um, campaigners for reform and trade unionists. Um, so I'm going to whiz through this now and get to the analysis. But basically, um, new, like, how did new ideas come onto the agenda in the two countries? So in Germany, this is kind of setting the scene. What the policy context at the time was a long, low paid parental leave. So um, families could get up to two years of parental leave payment and three years of job protected leave. This is for a, a policy enacted in the mid 80s. Um, and it was, um, but it was very low paid. So the equivalent of roughly about 300 euros a month. Um, and it was means tested after six months. Um, so not a lot of families actually received the full 300 a month. And it was nominally gender neutral, but had very low take up of fathers. And lots of researchers have showed, lots of researchers showed that um, the actual design of this policy served to encourage women to withdraw from the labor market. And that was, you know, a lot of people have speculated whether that was actually uh, part of the policy design. Because the political context is that the CDU liberal government that, um, that implemented that policy was attached to, I guess, a modified male breadwinner model. So women withdrawing from the labor market when they have children and perhaps returning part time once the child is at school. And it's worth noting that leave policy obviously is not the only driver of these kinds of decisions. There's, um, this was backed up by the lack of, there was an almost total lack of childcare for under threes, and also the fact that schools and um, nurseries and kindergartens for children older than three were almost always half day. So um, all these institutional factors overlock. Um, and the SPD as well was traditionally not interested in work family policy. It saw it as unimportant, basically a women's policy area. It was not as important as the main policies of the economy or the labor market. And this can be seen most clearly in um, Schroeder's famous, so Schroeder was the chancellor that won the election in 98 and his famous claim that the family minister was in charge of, uh, was responsible for women and all the other Gedurns. And Gedurns is, I guess the easiest way to translate that is, it's a kind of very dismissive way of saying stuff or rubbish, or something like that. It doesn't have a direct translation. Um, but the important point for the SPD is that after the 1998 election, which they won, party research found that young people were key to their narrow victory, and young women in particular. And their primary concern was work family reconciliation. So the party um, led to, this led to a project within the SPD leadership to create a new approach to family policy which was led by Renata Schmidt, who would become family minister in 2002. And then if we're talking about the actual processes of reform in Germany, then there are really two, two episodes of reform. One was a reform of the parental leave in 2000. So this is while the SPD are largely still on their old style of family policy. And Renata Schmidt is working behind the scenes. Um, and this focused on providing families with more flexibility and choice. So essentially what the policy was, was to tweak some of the rules around um, how you can take parental leave to try and encourage um, more women to, um, to enter the labor market and perhaps encourage a few more men to take it as well. And the notion that only 5% of fathers were taking it was brought up quite repeatedly in parliamentary debate. And this was framed as largely as a problem because fathers wanted to do more. It wasn't really um, conceptualized as any more than that. And the um, proposed reforms really didn't do much to enable fathers to take it anymore. Um, they were largely about offering more options to women to combine work and care, um, and perhaps not take the full two or three years. Um, it's worth noting here that employers fully opposed these reforms, arguing that this increased flexibility was way too costly for them. Um, but that was basically what happened in the early 2000s. But once Renata Schmidt became family minister in the second Red Green coalition, the approach changed quite dramatically. And um, this new project of sustainable family policy was put forward by the family ministry. And this is an example of very strong uh, process of agenda setting. So what family, uh, sustainable family policy was, was focused on twin, what was known as national problems. So almost seen as crises for German society. Um, a lack of work family reconciliation led to, on the one hand, low female employment and on the other hand, a low birth rate. And both of these things were seen as, um, well, uh, sort of promoted as um, detrimental to future German prosperity. Um, and fathers taking on greater care is one of the key aims for this. So here's a quote from one of the documents. It's just as mothers must be given an opportunity for more work, fathers should be given the chance for more family. 
And this was kind of a key theme, um, and particular linking what fathers do to mothers' labor market record. Um, and part of this was the proposal for, as I said before, this overhaul of this long, low paid parental leave to replace it with a 12 months earnings related Elton Geld with to lose it or use it part of months. Elton Geld is the name in German. Um, and this was framed as part of reducing the opportunity cost of having children, right? So on the one hand, um, reducing the income loss um, for families by um, replacing a low paid parental leave with earnings related um, parental leave, but also reducing the opportunity cost that women face from having uh, from being shut out of the thing. Um, but the but this reform, while being proposed, never went through before um, the change of government in two thousand and five. But it's and this is the perhaps the most interesting bit is that this, the new CDU led family ministry continued with sustainable family policy, almost essentially word for word policy for policy, including Elton Geld, which survived the coalition negotiations, despite it being quite a major part of the SPD's election campaign, and one that was criticized very heavily by almost all senior CDU members. And Ursula von der Leyen was appointed family minister here, she's obviously famous in other ways now. Um, I guess this was her breakthrough. <laughs> um, and she, um, she essentially pushed this policy through against fierce opposition from her within her own party. And the opposition was primarily targeted at these partner months. So this, this reserved months for fathers. Um, you got a lot of um, sort of quite outspoken leaders of the CDU, conservative leaders of the CDU, and also the more conservative Bavarian party, sister party, the CSU, who described it as things like nappy changing apprenticeships, and accused von der Leyen of telling people how they have to live and organize their family. And this was, there was quite a, a strong debate backwards and forwards in the press, but um, von der Leyen was um, insistent that these partner months would stay and caused quite a problem within the party because of that. Um, and would always relate what she was saying back to this sustainable family policy. So back here is an example of relating it back to the birth rate. So what is alarming is that the partial esteem for child raising, if it is perceived as an imposition that men take care of their own child for two months, more men than women exclude a child in their life planning and something has to change here. So she's essentially saying that these um, are essential both to the um, sort of employment for women argument that uh, perhaps appeals to the left more, but it's clear from my interviews anyway that these birth rate articles were, uh, birth rate arguments were very appealing to social conservatives. Um, especially the Bavarian lot. Um, and this um, agenda setting was um, powerful enough that when it actually came to the parliamentary debate, it was clear that these conservative men in leadership positions were actually in the minority. And all the women in the very conservative CSU party, for example, supported the proposals and argued for things like we need emancipated men. And we're using terms like that in terms of in, in parliament, in terms of why this is an important policy. It's notable that business became very supportive of these overall reforms. This actually had happened under the SPD. Um, and even if they weren't individually very keen on the partner months, they supported the overall agenda. Um, they were suspect, they um, basically were persuaded because of concerns about tight labor markets and skill shortages, um, and particularly supportive of things like childcare. But they were happy to sort of um, go along with the partner months, even if it wasn't their sort of first order preference because of all the other things that came along with it. Um, eventually, there was a compromise within the party. This is less important, but these two partner months were not, were reframed as a bonus rather than a um, quota. So instead of being two from 12, they became 12 plus two. So to mean. But in terms of the actual effects of the policy, that isn't so <laughs> So in terms of the UK then, um, the policy context is that maternity leave is very short and very low paid and very complicated. Um, I wrote quite a lot of this in my one of the chapters of my PhD and the footnotes just got longer and longer and longer about who was eligible for what. Why? But essentially all women were guaranteed, all women were entitled to 14 weeks job protected leave. Um, and then some women were um, entitled to 29 weeks. Some women were entitled to one form of payment, some women were entitled to the other form, of, another form of payment, none of the payment was very generous, 
And you got a weird situation where actually some women were entitled to 14 weeks leave for 18 weeks pay, which is quite not one. Um, and obviously in that context, there's no leave fathers. Um, in terms of the political context, the Conservative government had really no interest in improving leave policy at all. And in, in fact, spent the 80s making the eligibility criteria more complicated. Um, and their main perspective was that it should be for individual employers and employees to work out that this is not something the state should get involved with. And that can be seen in the 90s. So the um, opt out of the parental leave legislation um, directive in Europe was the first use of Britain's opt out um, of the social chapter. So they were, um, and that was relatively high profile at the time. Um, Labour really didn't have a great deal more interest in work family policy as a whole. Um, traditionally, but began to see it as a potential way to win women's votes, um, which was becoming a key, a key part of their electoral strategy after four successive defeats. Um, and this was heavily promoted by women MPs within the party, such as Harriet Harman, who, would, um, who spent a lot of time making the case that um, electoral, um, the electoral benefits you might have from improving um, work family reconciliation for women. Um, but in terms of leave policy, unlike childcare, in terms of leave policy, this didn't make huge inroads onto labour, into labour at first, and there was nothing really in the 97 manifesto. Um, and so what you see, essentially what you see in the UK is, is a kind of series of incremental reforms. Um, so in 99, you saw the introduction of unpaid parental leave, but this is because we had now signed up to the European Social Chapter. Um, and interviews, my interviews revealed that there was never any attention for this to be paid. Right? The departments um, involved, so the Department of Trade and Industry, um, didn't believe there was any demand for paid leave from fathers and um, thought that the sort of political battle against employers who were vehemently against any payment wouldn't be worth it for something that essentially was not wanted. And similar to in Germany, this document represent choice um, and providing options to people rather than relating um, anything rather than saying anything specific about fathers. Um, a few years later, there was a, a review of maternity pay and parental leave, and this is prompted by um, a desire within the party to have something to show to women before the 2001 election. So this was reported. Um, so all of this came out in the budget in 2001. And I think the election was in June of that year, so a couple of months later. So this was um, very clearly a um, electoral play. But it was, uh, there was also growing concern in the Treasury about a tight labour market, and this was the argument made to business over and over again, that essentially women were leaving the labour market because maternity leave was too short. And so if you want to retain your workers, retain skilled workers, then you would need, um, then we need to give them um, more, basically, more leave. So it sought to balance these twin aims of giving women what they want, which is how some of the documents put it, and not alienating employers. So, um, which led to a strange process of policy development, which essentially ministers went around the country asking parents what they wanted and then talking to businesses and then talking to parents again and then coming up with a consultation. So businesses had already been consulted by the time that the consultation comes out, which is a, was described to me anyway by civil servants as a very unusual way of doing this. Um, and there were, um, the, the result of this was basically large, large reforms in maternity leave. Um, so women got 12 months in total with six months paid, quite a significant increase in pay, although still this flat rate, um, and some, some other aspects, including the introduction of adoption leave, and then two weeks paid paternity leave, which actually emerged onto the agenda only through this consultation process. So it was through talking to families that the ministers basically realised that there was some demand for men, uh, from men. And the idea of paternity leave is to enable all fathers to have the choice to spend time supporting their partner and the new child. Um, but there was a, and there was a proposal to share leave, but this was rejected basically by opposition from almost everyone. So trade unions didn't like the idea of leave not being an individual right. Um, the campaigners for maternity leave reform, largely from the women's movement, didn't um, feel it was a priority to give things to men at this time when um, maternity leave was so desperately in need of um, improvement. And employers um, were very concerned about men leaving the labor market and costs associated with that, um, which they say here, we're concerned that any payment would increase absence from the workplace and affect business performance. So um, that's how they fought against pay for parental leave. 
Um, so this process of change perhaps could have gone differently in, from 2001. Well, there is a marked change in 2001 when Patricia Hewitt becomes the Minister of Trade and Industry. So Patricia Hewitt was a, a kind of long-standing um, feminist campaigner from within Labour. And she had written books previously about the importance of providing leave to men um, and all of the issues that we've discussed. And initially you see some hints in documents that um, there is a, sh a shift towards thinking about men's involvement in um, unpaid care in the family. And, um, but again, the eventual proposals that emerged from this round of reform is sort of in 2005, um, was a further extension of the paid period of maternity leave um, with the aim to pay the whole 12 months, although that is still not yet to happen. Um, the introduction of, and then, then this introduction of this relatively complicated scheme that we have now have the successor of, which is where mothers can give fathers leave um, if they don't use it, um, of which at this time it could be six months unused leave, of which three could be paid. So, but there was no increase in paternity leave, nor any increase in payment for parental leave, which is essentially the increase in payment for parental leave would be um, the German version or the Scandinavian version of what you might do in this situation. Um, and again, policy documents focus on providing choice. Um, and it's clear that this providing choice was a kind of nominal choice from, you know, the DTI impact assessment of this shared parental leave only assumes take up of between 1.2 and 1.5% per year, which is actually probably roughly, the, the figures aren't very good for that, probably is roughly what it is right now. So it's worth noting here that employers were strongly opposed, again, to leave for fathers, and we're explicit about that. Um, and again, most women's organisations who had campaigned and were still campaigning for improvements in maternity leave um, were essentially not very interested or actively opposed to providing leave to fathers because it, by the time women had got to 12 months leave, it was now seen as something you're taking away from women to give to men. And that um, did not sit right with a lot of um, campaigners. Um, there was no significant organised pressure from fathers. Um, and also there was a reluctance from the Labour leadership to be seen in telling families what to do. So all those factors combined to sort of stymie Hewitt's um, attempts. So basically, in, in comparison, then, if we're thinking about the ideas and the way that fathers were expressed in, in policy reforms and policy documents, there's quite a similar approach before 2002 of a priority of leave policy providing choice to improve women's access to the labour market. Uh, fathers mentioned in terms of helping or playing a more active role. Um, and in both countries, there was an acknowledgement that policy design hindered fathers' take up, but um, in neither country was there much legislative attempt to change that situation. But after 2002, there's this divergence. So sustainable family policy comes on, onto the scene and conceptualized fathers as a key part of the work family reconciliation problem. So um, basically it turned the focus of work family reconciliation away from solely focusing on work towards focusing on the family as well. Whereas what you can see in the UK is um, basically relentless focus on this process of work. Um, so I argue here that you can see that basically sustainable family policy acted as a coalition magnet um, in that it was this broad problem definition um, that of lack of work family reconciliation as a threat to Germany's future prosperity, prosperity both in economic and in demographic terms. Um, and in particular, you can see this in terms of the way that employers, well, I mean, you can see it in terms of the way that the CDU basically um, co-opted the entire policy agenda, but you can also see it in terms of the way that employers were persuaded to uh, support reforms that went a lot further than those they opposed in 2000. And this isn't really the result of changing labour market conditions or even changing projections, because before they opposed these reforms in 2000, there were already high profile reports explaining, well, <laughs> maybe not explaining is the wrong word, but um, highlighting that demographic trends and women's low labour market participation would lead to um, labour market supply problems in the 2000s. So instead of seeing leave policies entailing the imposition of costs, employers were persuaded to see the reform package as part of an essential part of modernising the German economy. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, there were other aspects of the overall um, overall agenda which persuaded the more conservative members to at least um, at least give their assent to um, some of these 
performs. And I argue that there's no such magnet in the UK. So employers basically were not persuaded at any point that it was a good idea to give leave to men. In fact, they continued, um, they got more and more um, aggressively opposed as the proposals got slightly stronger. Um, and they continued to see leave policy as primarily imposing costs. And it's notable that Hewitt, then, when she was trying to promote a different approach, couldn't really draw on wider support. Um, and this is related both to employers' opposition, but also fragmented views about the purpose of leave policy, even among supporters. Um, and I also argue that ideas play an important role here as a roadmap as well. So sustainable family policy was a, a consistent project pursued in remarkably similar terms throughout this whole period. Right? And it was promoted first by the CDU, uh, sorry, SPD, and then the CDU, and based on a good deal of um, theoretical and empirical research that argued that it was actually Germany's institutional structures, such as the long parental leave, that were causing part of these problems. Right? And father's leave was a key part of the solution here. It wasn't a kind of thing that was added on at some point, it was there from the very beginning. Um, and in political battles, von der Leyen could draw on these ideas to make her case. So these ideas had been established in political discourse and it enabled her to take on entrenched views about male breadwinner model families as expressed by the conservatives in her party in a way that Hewitt was not able to do um, in the UK. It also explains why she did not drop the partner months because one of the things you can look at this is just say, um, why did she fight so hard for getting the partner months through when moving, shifting to an earnings related benefit would anyway increase father's take up of leave slightly. Um, and the, again, this is a contrast with the UK. So Hewitt in particular lacked this roadmap when pushing for changes. So the arguments that had previously been used for maternity expansion, um, basically that women were dropping out of the labor market, so you needed to improve maternity leave for them, um, couldn't be used for men because men were not dropping out of the labor market and employers actually saw the proposals as encouraging men to leave the labor market. Um, and nor did labor, labor politicians see um, fathers leave policies as vote winners. Um, so she had to settle for providing choice um, rather than um, anything that's more incentivized. Um, so just quickly, um, what I argue here is that you can't understand these ideational changes without examining the political context. And in particular, it's this notion of the window of opportunity provided by electoral benefits of work policy change that allowed these ideas to come onto the agenda of both political parties. And what I argue is actually these, this window of opportunity was interpreted by politicians in fundamentally different ways. So in Germany, um, that both the SPD and later the CDU interpret it as an opportunity to create a new policy agenda that they could own in the long term. Whereas in the UK, it's very much more seen in a transactional way to deliver what women want in exchange for votes. And you can see this by both the rounds of reform of maternity leave were announced shortly before elections, as I said before. And um, a lot of the interviews highlighted that this was a key, um, key driver of reform as well. Um, but this interpretation itself is related to their respective political contexts. So um, Labour had gone through this process of modernisation since 1987. I mean, they kept losing elections and they went through a, a quite intense process of policy modification, which culminated in Blair and New Labour, um, which resulted in a very tightly controlled political agenda. So, um, and particularly one that aimed to signify to the electorate that this was not old Labour. Um, and that relates in particular here to policies associated with gender equality and those promoted perhaps by um, feminists, as they would um, uh, sort of perhaps disparagingly say. Um, and so policies that were seen as intervening in families to try and achieve some of these aims were seen as potentially off-putting. So um, the focus really for Labour leadership was on giving things to women. Whereas German, German political institutional system meant that the SPD actually, although it had also lost four elections, it wasn't excluded from power in the same way. But right? it was it was a quite an, an important regional player in a lot of governments, and the constitution meant that in the second house in parliament, it, um, it controlled a lot of power. And so it though so they didn't go through a similar process of, of reform. And actually, if anything, after 1998, the party leaders were searching for new ideas because they were worried that 
they basically won by default after everyone got tired of the CDU after 16 years. Um, and so they were actively searching for new policy platforms. So this leads into why they interpreted it in this different way. And this led to different power dynamics in the two reform processes. So journal reform project is, um, as I hope I've indicated, it's quite strategic and top down, um, led by ministers who both had the support, uh, support of their respective chancellors. Whereas in the UK, these ideas um, came in a much more bottom up way from outside the Labour leadership. So promoted by um, often backbench Labour MPs and also kind of almost crowdsourced from women around the country. Um, and from and so campaigners were um, sort of women's movement campaigners were very um, influential in how these ideas got onto the agenda. And this therefore interacted with the policy legacies differently. So in Germany, the priority was to overhaul the, the whole approach to work family policy. So this meant that um, existing policies were themselves partly to blame for the problems. And this can, um, and then led to this overhaul of um, parental leave. Well, in the UK, um, the key priority basically for lots of campaigners and for a lot of these women MPs was to urgently improve the very inadequate maternity leave. And um, as you can see, this came in quite an iterative way um, possibly at the expense of a more strategic vision about what you want the policy architecture to look like in the long run. Um, and it's quite interesting talking to some of these campaigners now about how they feel that went at the time and where mistakes, well, not mistakes, but um, how that context um, emerged. Okay, so, so I essentially argue that while the dynamics of reform in Germany and the UK were in some senses similar, they also demonstrate substantial differences and the, as I just said, the German reforms were top-down strategic and long-term um, with the aim of establishing a whole new approach to work family reconciliation, while the UK was more bottom-up and iterative, so aimed at short-term electoral incentives and um, also avoiding conflict with potential opponents. So for, for Labour, avoiding con conflict with business groups was a key priority. Um, in explaining differences, this fi these findings that I've highlighted here concur with the literature highlighting electoral competition as a key impetus for reform, um, but it doesn't really explain these diverging trajectories and the focus on ideas um, particularly reveals that in Germany, the focus was on, if we think of work family reconciliation as involving both work and family, in Germany, it was the focus was on both, while in Britain, it was just on work rather um, largely. Um, and this was important, not only in terms of the content, but also in the political fortunes of respective ideas um, and I've talked about that and so um, the emergence of these more powerful ideas in Germany or ideas that have uh, had an impact um, in politics can be traced back to these different interpretations of the window of opportunity in the two countries. Um, and I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you very much, and Sam. And Stephen Sam is probably up in the It's a short one, Sam. Yeah. I know the Bernice that the C in CDU and CSU stands for Christian, mm -hmm. not conservative, uh, which makes me just wonder, question mark, whether or not uh, willingness to engage in family plus employment fits well with a Christian and conservative party where that conjunction does not exist in more secular Britain. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, yeah, so I think there may be differences in the kind of fundamental, uh, not fundamental, but sort of deeply held ideas in the two countries about what's acceptable. Although it's the Christian aspect is, um, is one that uh, on the one hand wants to protect families, but on the other hand also um, through the notion of subsidiarity very strongly thinks that the state should not be involved in families. And so it's, um, while there is a very strong idea running through the um, British case that the state, had, there's a limit to what the state should be doing in terms of telling people what to do or how, how you might want to phrase it. I think you can also see that in Germany and you can see it in some of those arguments from the conservative leaders of those two parties. Um, but in terms of your, your broader point about differences in the, the fundamentals ideas that these that these policies were running up against, I think there is something how to say that um, certainly Labour found it more challenging 
um, to challenge those ideas than they did in Germany. Thank you. Yeah, really interesting. I suppose um, I've got the very obvious question is so so how would how how might the UK think of the German track now? <laughs> <laughs> what would its window of opportunity be and uh, how much exploit it? <laughs> well um there is um employers aren't as against these kind of policies as they used to be. Um perhaps there is a a, a lessening of um strangeness to these policies over time. I mean, they've been discussed a lot. There was an attempted reform under the coalition, I think, that might have moved a bit in this direction, but it didn't go anywhere. And, um, but I guess the windows of opportunity thing is a, a difficult question. I talk about it quite a lot in my thesis as, as a process by which, um, you know, societal changes lead to a new demand. In, in a country, and that is um, both related to sort of socioeconomic trends, but also the political dynamics at the time. Um, in terms of a window of opportunity, I mean, British politics is, um, <laughs> it doesn't seem like these kind of opportunities arise very often. Um, you know, which is in fact, a lot of people's criticisms of New Labour in the first place is that they didn't seize a lot of these in the, in the round. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it, it also, I mean, if you want to create change, perhaps some of these findings suggest ways of, you know, going back to the agenda setting literature of how more significant change can be created. But as I've said, the, uh, the success or failure of ideas is fundamentally linked to political and institutional context. So it's not, you can't just invent opportunities out of the air. We have Tanya and then Tim and maybe both um, um, first and then Sam for um, a couple back. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Sam. That was really, really fascinating. I just wanted to pick up on one element of the contrast that you drew, if I understood you rightly, which was between the more bottom up policy development in the case of Labour uh, and the more top down in the case of SPD. We're used to thinking of, or I'm used to thinking of participatory policy processes as progressive and more likely to produce radical agendas. But here you seem to be giving us an example where exactly the opposite was the case and that perhaps because of the particular stakeholders that Labour engage with, or perhaps just because actually public opinion wasn't broadly behind or that interested in Father's Leave at the time, that you got a more limited agenda produced by a more participatory policy process than you did from a more top-down process, which was able to be more perhaps thought leading or public opinion leading um, through being top-down. So I'm, I'm interested in whether you think that's a sort of accurate characterization of that particular element of the contrast that you were drawing. And if so, whether you think that might have wider application to other policy areas as well, and we maybe need to rethink uh, whether participatory policy making is always the radical alternative. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Timo. Thanks, Sam. That was really interesting. It's nice to see. Um, it's nice to see like qualitative comparative research being presented. Um, I forgive me for asking a question that's not well. You met. You mentioned it. It came up in a. Uh, but it's in a way slightly slightly divergent from the bulk of what you presented on, but I was really interested in that um, that chart that you presented near the beginning of your talk about the leading countries for um, for uh, father for fathers please dad 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 what did it say dad in time daddy. <laughs> yeah, whatever <laughs> anyway um, <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, um, it, it struck me that the thing that, that the leading countries almost all had in common was they're very homogenous, and I guess ethnically homogenous. And so I'm just wondering to what extent, and I don't know how much you can unpack this in your, in sort of UK and Germany case, because I don't know how sort of, um, I don't even want to begin to, to say how more or less um, Germany is in terms of being heterogeneous than the UK. I just don't, I don't, I don't have the answer to that question. But 
but like to what extent that um, do you think plays a role in um, supporting these policies? Because um, I just couldn't help but think that that was that that was something that they all had in common. Like South Korea was really high up on the list. The Scandinavian countries, Luxembourg, I don't think is terribly diverse. So yeah, mm. interesting. Um, okay, uh, well to Tanya's point, um, yeah, I mean you're you're right. Your summary of my conclusions there are right. I mean it is it is a case where. It does seem to be a case where um, engagement with sort of um, campaigners and things like that led to a kind of policy um, development that wasn't very um, strategically thought out. Um, as for you know, as for why that is, I think there are a lot of reasons for why that is that relate to the political situation that was at the time. So I spoke to quite a few. Um, campaigners and also Labour MPs, and they were talking about how, you know, a lot of these people have been campaigning on this stuff for years um, and getting nowhere. You know, it was, um, so we're talking like 20 years, 15 years for campaigning for maternity leave improvements, and just the Conservative government was just not interested in the slightest. And so once they did get some um, influence, they just pushed, they were just pushing and pushing and pushing. And, um, I think the fact that Labour were seeing it so much as a kind of do something for women approach fed into that because they just wanted and they wanted to hear what women wanted and there were lots of women telling them, lots of campaigning groups telling them what women wanted and those two things married up very nicely. Now, I, um, so it, it, we're talking both about um, you know, I think if you were thinking about an ideal way of engaging with participants and things like that, it's not just saying, what do you want right now? Um, it would be, ideally, I, I would assume, to think about strategically, what, what do you want this policy to look like? What's the ideal? And I think those kind of questions were never really asked in this process um, and never really thought about by a lot of the campaigners until, until sort of the mid to late 2000s, after a lot of this stuff had um, already been done. I mean, I think there's perhaps, in terms of the wider implications of that, um, I think it's possibly to do with both, um, you know, demand and supply for new policies, right? So where are you sourcing policy ideas for? And as a, if, if you're a government, then um, what, how are you treating what you're receiving to a certain extent? Um, I think in terms of implications for this work, I think you can see a lot of um, path dependence in once you embark a wrap, a down this kind of iterative process, even once people try and put the brakes on, there's sort of momentum in that process. And so um, I think, you know, the, the benefits of thinking strategically are often um, difficult to see until maybe it's too late. <laughs> um, but as to, as to speaking, as to the general point, I'm, I mean, I would agree that it's good to involve <laughs> uh, participants as much as possible. Um, but it's probably a, f a feature of the, just the political dynamics at the time, uh, which may be a feature of political dynamics now, if you think about how long the Tories have been in power as well. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> um, Tim, in terms of your question, I mean, I guess this is a frequent kind of uh, observation when Ever we talk about Scandinavian countries being the best at something to a certain extent. Um, and I know that there is quite a lot of debate in the literature about the extent to which um, that makes a difference in, in social policy, in support for sort of solidistic social policy more generally. Um, in terms of how it might impact um, leave and parental leave, I mean, I honestly haven't really thought about it. I would assume that, um, I mean, is the, is the implication, I, you could say that, I mean, why wouldn't, so maternity leave would be popular among, I mean, policies to improve work family reconciliation, one might assume are popular among all groups in society to a certain extent, right? Um, so in terms of support for these kind of policies, I wouldn't see um, 
I wouldn't see that necessarily there would be a lot of difference there. It may, may not be a priority in different contexts, but um, I think what you're maybe spotting is smaller countries rather than um, more homogenous. But I don't, that's not a very adequate answer. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting point. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation, really interesting. Um, so you, so the starting point is here, the traditional male breadwinner model, and um, I, I guess here we're thinking a lot about what is happening also to female labor market participation. So I think, yeah, I'll be thinking here about the rental lease policies, but I think also other policies like the broader context and the whole tax benefit system or childcare policies will also matter a lot. Uh, so I think this question goes a bit beyond your presentation, but I was just wondering what your thoughts are. So in the UK, I think there has been this gradual move away from social insurance, individual-based payments towards means-tested family payments, uh, which means that, for example, the work incentives of secondary earners, usually the women, are weaker. Mm -hmm. Or in Germany, there has been, I think for many years, they've had this joint yeah. income taxation system that hasn't really changed, which again is, I guess, somewhat damaging for women and secondary earners. Yeah. So if we consider this broader context, I was wondering what would you say, is it really that German reforms have been so fast, so really fast departing? Mm -hmm. Or in the context of the UK, have these incremental changes been really towards improving uh, gender neutral, gender equality, or have they been, if you consider the, broad, the broader context, have they been actually damaging? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's a really good point that we're focused really here on one aspect of um, a huge collection of policies. I mean, one of the things that um, you read in any article on family policy, and I had to spend a lot of time writing about in my thesis was what is family policy, what counts and what doesn't count. Um, and so to a certain extent, you have to um, draw boundaries somewhere. I think in terms of your general question, yeah. I mean, so to take the German case, there is still this tax system that does still um, incentivize um, unequal earnings among families. It was actually a von der Leyen tried to get rid of it, um, but wasn't able to. So that is something um, perhaps that has different political, if we're talking about a particular policy area that has different political dynamics because of the amount of people that it benefits directly, perhaps. Um, in terms of the UK, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the iterative, I, mean, I think a lot of the problem with this kind of, with iterative policymaking in this case is that you do take steps in one direction and then steps back and um, things like that. It's not clear, um, for example, that, yeah, that uh, many of the reforms, um, aside from the childcare ones, have made a huge amount of difference to um, to ending the male breadwinner model or to changing gender roles. Um, but yeah, but I think it's always. I mean, yeah. So I've drilled down into one policy area, but my my thesis is on work family policy more broadly. And as you say, there's another layer of policy. I mean, almost the entire welfare state can be related to these kind of questions. And and yeah, and then the picture becomes much much murkier. Um, I think you can still see a trend um, in Germany towards attempting to make, um, perhaps this is a quite sort of banal way of putting it, but attempting to make life easier for young parents, um, which doesn't seem to have ever been a feature of policy here. Um, uh, I had two questions. The better question is I just asked. <laughs> the stupid question. <laughs> But I, I was wondering, uh, in the Indian context, I was thinking about how the different sort of labor policies and some seem to be championed by, uh, you know, the Ministry of Women and Child Development, and some seem to be championed by uh, sort of trading kind of institutions. Yeah. What I saw in the slides was uh, in two countries, there were two champions for these causes, one in the home, the family ministry and the other one in the trade. Uh, and, and I wonder if the kind of champions and the place that these champions are based out of impacts the kind of 
uh, you know, change that a society or a state could experience? And did you have any sort of... Um... Yes, um, it's a really good question. It's not a stupid question at all. It's, um, yes, I think, yeah, that, and you're right to highlight that in Germany has a family ministry, right, which is responsible for family, women, children, old people. Yeah, stop us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But, um, and they, um, so one thing that happened during this period is that the family ministry had traditionally um, seen these policy areas as relatively silent, right? And this process was, it became the family ministry over the women's ministry or over yeah. the old person's ministry. Or, and, um, but you're right that there's an institutional position there that doesn't exist in the UK. Right, so yeah, I talked about the um, Minister for Trade and Industry because that was the policy, um, that was the department that had responsibility for this um, policy area. And it's worth noting that that policy, that department has a reputation as being a sort of business friendly department. Right, so if we're thinking about explanations for why maybe business views were taken so strongly in the UK, that might be an answer. I guess my, um, my, ch my challenge to whether that's a really important factor or not is that um, essentially what was important was whether the, um, the leaders of the parties agreed with these policies or not. Because um, the family ministry is a unified ministry, but it's not one that has traditionally been considered very important. It's not an, really one that sets the agenda of public debate or anything like that. So it's, um, it was because you know, the leaders of the family policy were able to, um, family ministry were able to persuade their colleagues to a certain extent, and their bosses essentially of that that is more of an explanation for why change came about i think and in that con con uh, contrast you can clearly see that um you know patricia here wasn't able to do that and von der Leyen was so but it's a really yeah i mean it is an element that i didn't need to, to give and zoom and please um Thank you very much, Sam. Um, very clearly articulated. And um, I, I do know what you were working on, so um, um, I'm not new to this. Um, my question builds on the previous point that was made and also a couple of others. And it's mainly to do with the other area that you touched on at the outset, which is childcare. And I just wondered whether in either of the countries, there was any ever thinking about trade-offs between childcare and parental leaves and whether that was factored in at all at any point. Um, because it is quite interesting how in each country there have been um, developments in, care, in relation to childcare as well. I know that in England we've got childcare and education combined, which is not the case in Germany. But I was just wondering about there being any trade-offs or anything along those lines? Um, so I, in terms of trade-offs, I think that both countries kind of landed on a model where um, sort of one-to-one -one care within the family was appropriate for the first year. And then in Germany, they were quite explicit that then, then you have, so this is in childcare policy, then you, they, they brought in a right for all children to have access to a childcare place after um, their first birthday, which is the point at which parental leave ends. Um, in the UK, it was, they were quite explicit about a similar point. By, by the time you get to these 2004, um, 2005 period under Patricia Hewitt, some of these policy areas were being discussed together. I mean, previously, they weren't being discussed together at all. So the Department of Trade and Industry was doing that, and childcare was somewhere else. Child, childcare was sort of treasury driven or in the education department. Um, and once they did start being taught together, they were taught in this sort of pattern of um, 12 months within the family and then, well, then do what you want, basically. Um, <laughs> but as I mean, as you know, real support for childcare only really kicks in once children are three. So um, there is a much larger gap in the UK that, that resulted from that. But in terms of direct trade-offs, I'm not sure because we're talking about children under, under one, really. Um, yeah. Thank you. Emmanuel. Hi. I'm not going to ask you an idea question. 
I was really taken that there were a few times in your presentation, I know at the beginning you said you reviewed a bunch of policy documents and then you also did interviews. And there were a few points when you suggested that they either coordinated together or built on each other. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about if how the stories differed depending on those sources and what you got out of them and what you did if they contradicted one another. So um, it varied in the two countries actually quite a lot. So um, in the UK, the policy documents were relatively, there are a lot of them, right? They seem to release them all the time. Um, and they kind of repeat the same lines over and over again. Like there is a set way of writing these documents. And so talking to um, civil servants in particular was a very useful way of getting behind, you know, what was actually going on at each, at each of these stages, because essentially there were kind of two or three stages in the UK. So understanding what was going on sort of behind this, there's, there seems to be less visibility of what's going on in the UK than there is in Germany. So in Germany, a lot of these debates were played out in public, right? In, um, in the UK, it was through talking, it was through the interviews that allowed me to see, um, to see uh, who was, you know, who was promoting what, for what reason and why. And, you know, and often that is, the policy documents are kind of the end point. So it was really looking at, I knew, so Patricia Hewitt has written about this in public. I knew that she tried to, she had writes about this as an example of a sort of policy failure. So I knew that she has tried to do that. And I knew that the end point was this further expansion of maternity leave. But there's a large gap in there, which is just, you can't see. And you like contemporary media reports don't tell you about it either, like they do in Germany. So in Germany, there's a lot more of this stuff is in the public domain. So in Germany, it was, um, I mean, there's the same sort of questions, but they were, they, I guess the interviews were less, slightly less important in Germany at reading behind what the documents were saying. Partly also because German parliament involves, I mean, parliament debates under Labour were almost pointless to a certain extent. They had such large majorities. It didn't really matter what the Conservatives were saying at this point in time. And so what happened during debates wasn't very, wasn't necessarily very interesting, but this, what, that's not the case in Germany, which is always a much more, um, you know, because of proportional representation, has a much broader section of what different parties think. Did you know that from the, on, from the outset that you were going to do both? Or did you start yeah. with one and then you were unsatisfied? Um, well, in chronological order, I did start with documents and was unsatisfied, but it was always the plan to supplement that Afterwards. And I think that was probably the better way around of doing it. I think it started with interviews in my opinion. Well, I don't know. <laughs> um, but it was much easier to get people to talk to me in Germany than it was in the UK. They kind of just assume that you're out to get them. <laughs> There's no question. Oh, it's, it's in there. Oh, I will just chuck one in. Yeah, just a, a short one. So it's um, um, I was thinking about lone parents. So a lot of the policy is focused on lone parents in the UK, particularly in terms of labour supply. Yeah. Um, and I guess there that means that they're not thinking about fathers at all. Um, and I wondered whether this was also part of what was going on differently in the two countries, that you know, the sort of family model. I mean, but obviously there were lone parents in Germany as well, but not um, not so much an explicit part of how the family is thought about the things. Mm. I just wondered whether there, there was any, any, any sort of that on, on the way that things went and why it was kind of so, um, you know, women focused. In yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's certainly true. To say that it was lone parent focused was certainly true of the sort of initial policy. Um, proposals, sort of the late 90s ones. I think by the time you get to the mid-2000s, they are largely focused on child development as the sort of main frame through which they're talking about family policy. And so I think it has, I mean, obviously they are still focused on lone parents because they've set themselves targets for employment rates and it's related to um, their child poverty targets. But the, the way that family policy was being discussed had moved away from, I mean, it's, it's noticeable in the documents that it's much broader than that. Um, but lone parents played a role in Germany as well. I mean, one of the ways in which, this is a childcare story, so it's not talked about here, but one of the ways in which um, Renata Schmidt was able to get the first childcare funding through was to point out that when Germany was um, basically restructuring its benefit system, they'd completely forgot about what lone parents are supposed to be doing in this time. So I think 
Um, they, you're right that they're not as numerous in Germany, but it's not insignificant either. So, um, yeah, it certainly plays a factor, but whether it plays a sort of deciding factor, I'm not sure. I did have one question comment, um, kind of picking up a few questions from, from earlier. And um, um, zooming out, um, the case is essentially about um, the reform capacity in two different countries, essentially, where both have a pretty bad starting point, but one is slightly better, and that um, country with a slightly better um, starting point then screws up. Um, and I um, um, wonder um, whether, um, and because you talked a lot about the state and whether fundamentally um, the UK, even though it is more liberal and should have been more responsive because of its liberalism, is certainly to a certain extent doomed um, to fail, whereas Germany paradoxically because of the Christian legacy and the kind of that's a paternalism that is in Germany that shouldn't be um, favor certain policies, then actually provides belief in the state we just don't have. So from an ideational point, if you put kind of a strict ideational hat on, um, are we here doomed to fail? So am I in the wrong country? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so as you know from my thesis, that's a personal major part of the work that I didn't discuss here. And I guess, the question of whether some ideas are essentially more sticky or more powerful than others is an impossible one to answer to a certain mm -hmm. extent. Right? It's, um, as I said to Stephen's question, it's certainly true that this idea of non-intervention in the family did apply to Germany as well. Mm -hmm. So there is a paternalist thing, but it's about looking after the interests of the family largely in terms of providing them with money, right? And I think what you see over this period is that if you were going to say that these liberal ideas are the big things holding back the UK in terms of um, sort of shifting its approach to family policy, then the big thing holding back Germany was um, a attachment to the male breadwinner model. Mm. It's not clear to me that um, that should be um, an easier thing to break through new ideas, right? And you can see from I mean, I only kind of hinted at it today, but the kind of political debates that von der Leyen went through um, were pretty ferocious. And mm. I think one of the stories there is that in Germany, they tried to change the ideas. And in the UK, they, every opportunity, they shied away from that completely. And there's, there's a real difference, which I didn't really talk about in terms of the level of publicity that Labour sort of put into these policies compared to what was happening in Germany. In Germany, these were very high profile, big public debate. Von der Leyen was a sort of celebrity minister. In the UK, they were, these were very sort of quiet. They didn't really trumpet them that much. They were, they were worried about too much scrutiny about what they were doing. And, um, you know, that, that sort of boldness or timidity is, is perhaps more of an explanation than whether a certain kind of idea is more powerful, but I mean, <laughs> what I find interesting, if, if, if one looks at the UK situation at the moment and the development of an um, um, alternative project, if one looks at Labour um, and looks possibly at a Labour leader um, who is quite timid and whether and based um, on um, your comparison, whether this isn't basically from the outset the wrong strategy, so whether then the German case um, would suggest or even kind of looking at what the conservatives did, that you're actually more likely to succeed and to attract if you're bold rather than just try to, to hide and not to offend all the time. So that's a bit, um, I think from the beginning, the kind of early discussion kind of, um, yeah, um, um, how do we get change? But, um, well, you know, I've been wondering about it for a long time. <laughs> Anyhow, we, it's, it's um, almost half past, so we um, are at the point where we thank you for your um, and presentation, everybody for, um, for coming. Um, um, when um, you had your um, 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 upgrade, you kind of, it was described as contemporary history, um, um, with which I somewhat struggled because I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, but we have um, next week something that is a bit more history, 
So we have um, Leo um, presenting, and he goes back to, to Nixon, so from Ursula von der Leyen and um, progressive change in, in families um, to, to the US and Nixon um, in our um, historical um, journey in the second house. So we are looking forward to having um, Leo, and he's smiling there. He, he's apparently looking forward to that already. <laughs> um, um, hope to see many of you then again. And in the meantime, have a lovely day. Thank <laughs> you.